we talked a lot about the war in Ukraine. It's sort of war on our continent, mm. the European continent, and that's scared a lot of people because if you look back in history, these wars have a habit of spreading. Yep. We've lived in a period of relative calm, end of the Cold War, 30 years of peace dividend. Now feels a much more dangerous world. And I guess, I mean, it's a huge topic, but you know, the Defence Review is, is about started now. The Labour government's decided to launch Defence Review. But it almost feels like the answer is 2.5%. What's the question? And, and yet, 2.5% isn't going to remotely cut it compared to the Cold War era, which it feels like we need to return to. So I guess I'd start by going, what the hell is the role of air power in this defence review, given that there's no money, yeah. vision without funding is hallucination. Yeah. So what is the role of air power in this future world? So to make that case, I need to sort of come back a few steps. So if you, if you look at the last, let's pick uh, 15 years, it's not a bad slice, and I'm not doing that deliberately to overlap with a Conservative government. Um, but the last 15 years, we have seen chronic underinvestment in the UK defence over all of those 15 years, apart from maybe the last couple where there was a bit of an uptick and an injection. Um, the reason for that is... Back in 2010, and even before then, the world was a much more peaceful place. We picked our wars. They were normally against someone that was a bit easy to beat up. Um, and therefore, we didn't need to spend money on high tech or high capabilities. Um, in my view, that was a mistake. Um, and forgetting that Russia and China were just around the corner, even if we just had to deter them or match them, um, we forgot that and therefore we stopped spending on the types of capabilities or at least the numbers or depth of capabilities that we needed to sort of deter or meet those types of threats. Now that they've turned up with a vengeance, um, we're now trying to play catch up. Now, you can't just flick a switch and suddenly up your budget that, that allows you to just suddenly change that overnight. Um if you look at the 2% we've been spending, plus or minus the odd delta on that, um, it's not been enough to, to maintain the sorts of levels that we had during the Cold War. Um, and those are the sorts of levels we need to be thinking about, certainly in terms of depth. You know, our wars for the last 15, 20 years, we assume they'd be six months long. Well, that doesn't work. Um, it, particularly if you start basing your ammunition stocks and all your fuel stocks and all your people on six months assumptions, they all start to fall apart when you start talking about years or talk about threats that are much, much higher. So 2% is not enough. I can tell you now 2.5% probably isn't enough on the current plan. In fact, probably 3 or 3.5% 3 is, is not really going to cut it. What you're talking about is getting back to a sustained position and how long it's going to take you to get back to where you need to be that you can then sustain those numbers. Because 25 might have been enough to sustain, but not after 15 years of underinvestment where 2 wasn't enough. Or but maybe, it, but even if to, even that, if you go back to your and I, early time in the air force, you know we were Cold War and it was four or five percent. It was, and actually defence hasn't got cheaper in that time. No, it's got more expensive. Yeah. Technology's got more expensive. It hasn't yeah. got cheaper over time, and therefore, yeah. you know the, the numbers that the, I, I accept the fact that the, the, the country is bankrupt at the moment. Yeah, but if the number one priority of a government is to look after its people, protection of its yeah. people. Surely the, the, you can either start a defence review with what does the country need and then fund it, yeah. or you start with this is how much money we've got, tell me what I can get for that money. Yeah. The former seems to be the way it feels we should be going. The latter seems the way it's actually being done. Yeah, it's probably a combination of either of those, and it's not quite clear yet exactly how this is going to play out. So my understanding is, is that the review is going to look at the threat. So, so what is the problem? The problem is going to be Russia is clearly being aggressive here and now. It's not like a future threat. It's a, a clear and present threat. And clearly China isn't far behind when whatever it may or may not do around Taiwan in particular. So so those are the clear and present threats. Actually, they haven't changed. They've been there for, for, for lots of decades. Um, we just didn't perhaps pay enough attention to them. If the answer is, okay, so we now know what the threat is, but I've got 2.5% to spend at some time between now and the end of this parliament, that bounds your solution. Um, now, my understanding is the review is not going to come up with a solution. It's just going to come up with a problem. The problem will then be, okay, how do you now meet that threat? So that's a so second question. If you limit yourself to 2.5%, as clearly currently we are planning to do, and it's not obvious how they could go beyond that because the money's not there, um, then that you can't do everything. You can't do everything now, let alone everything you might want to do to fix the problem. So bringing your question back to what, what why is air, air, air power important, 
I think the argument's going to be, what do we prioritize? What is it that we can spend the least amount of money on for the greatest amount of impact? Um, and that could well mean letting some other things go. Now, there's lots of debates about that. So there is the Indo-Pacific important? Because if it's not important, then you start to have a question about the shape and size of your Navy. And whether we like it or not, that's going to bring in a discussion about the carriers. If NATO is important, we then have to decide whether we're going to rely on continental armies to fight that war for us on land, and the UK doesn't therefore spend too much money on its army, or does it? Uh, and all these questions are going to have to come out as part of the review. My argument would be, you've already got some pretty capable air power, it's just rather thin, that actually, for a relatively small outlay, you could get that air power up to the numbers and size and shape that it needs to be to be a far greater deterrent capability than it would than you would have to spend on your navies and your armies. So I think the question ultimately is going to be, what's the most bang I can get for my limited buck? Um, so one of the things that John Healy has been very vocal about, particularly some of the groups that I've engaged with, is that depends on who you engage will be the answer you get back. So, for example, if you engage the Air Force, the answer yep. is more Starship Enterprises, yep. um, Joint Strike Fighters, you know, um, all expensive assets. And yet, is it a time for a Strike Master type capability, as we found with Ukraine, that actually quantity sometimes has a quality all of its own? Yeah. If you simply ask industry, BA Systems will say, well, the answer is we've got to have Tempest, yeah. or, um, um, uh, or whatever it's called today. Yeah. And, and, and therefore, how do you strip this away yeah. to saying that uh, bluntly Russia appears to have prevailed, used force against a non-nuclear country and got away with it. Yeah. Most countries in the world, well over 95% of the countries are not nuclear powers. Therefore, 95% of the countries are vulnerable under the same rules. And our national interest isn't just in our shores. It's around lithium. It's around uranium. It's yeah. around gold, it's around mineral resources around the world, that many countries are not nuclear powers, are therefore vulnerable. Yeah. It feels that if we are going to stop, you know, some of these axes of evil controlling all of that, that yeah. we have to have a credible military that isn't just going to protect the uh, British shores, it's also going to protect our interests yeah. overseas. And that feels like it's going to be an incredibly expensive if we are simply talking about the air power part of it being the gold-plated solution. If you try and do everything at all levels, which is what we tried to do, in fact, that's probably been the reason we've got to the position we're in, is that when when we went back down to 2% after the Cold War, but still acted as, as if we were an empire nation that had interests all around the world, and more importantly, perhaps tried to maintain an edge in every military capability that was going, whether that was sub submarines, nuclear, special forces, I-Star, space, combat aircraft, you name it. We tried to stay at the top tier everywhere. And we did a pretty good job of doing it. But you can't do that forever. You know, if, if you join the premiership and throw money at the problem, you can win maybe one season and then then guess what? You start to struggle, have a couple of injuries and the depth of your squad suddenly gets exposed. We are now 20 years into having a very, very thin squad and we can no longer afford to buy the most expensive players. So what we've done, we'd, we'd have been far better off staying in the second or third division and doing really well every year as opposed to trying to shoot for the moon but not having the budget to allow you to do that. Mm. So we've sort of created the problem for ourselves by being but by trying to be good at everything. So maybe we have to let some of those things go. And that's going to be difficult because every single one of those things will have a supporter that will argue its case. I think the important thing is we don't need to be subjective. We do war games about this all the time and then we ignore them. Those war games demonstrate exactly what things work and what things don't work. But we always just kind of push them to one side and say, yeah, but it wouldn't be like that for real. We also have some, some hard-edged uh, reality in Ukraine do armies deter Russia? Well, clearly not. Do navies re deter Russia? Well, I'm not sure Russia's going to have a navy by the time this war's finished, the way things are going. So that is also a question that we need to think through. Um, if he's offering the greatest reward for an F-16 shooting down, I wonder what it is that might be worrying him the most. I think NATO air power in general, not just the UK, NATO air power in general is what frightens Russia the most. It's the one thing that they aren't quite sure whether they can defeat. The reason they've spent so much money on S-300s, S-400s, is that was their, their, their way of negating Western air power. Well, now that we know those don't work as well as we think, um, that will be worrying Russia. So if you want a deterrent 
I would argue that air and space power are probably our two aces in the pack. So how do you, though, you and I have lived this for 30 plus years, God forbid, um, and yet it's actually very difficult to explain what air power is to you, to the general public, <clears throat> what air and space power is to you. Yeah. We really struggle with that narrative. You and I understand it, but it sounds like a bunch of Star Wars type uh, folks. How do we get that to resonate yeah. with the population in a language they understand and in a format that's digestible? We write a book, Sean. <laughs> yeah. We write a book. You see? <laughs> you gave, yeah, you but gave him the chance. I, I gave him the chance. But, yeah. but my challenge back to you is that, yeah. Yeah, you know, I helped with this. Yeah. But when I showed it to Burn, he, he did exactly what I'd expect people to do. They flipped through it. Oh, yeah, it's jolly interesting. Nice quote. Right. And you Not sort exactly. Of, no, but, it, but it is, that is a definitely a great first step. But the challenge philosophically yeah. is how does our country genuinely understand the difference between a very expensive fighter jet and air power? It's a tough slog. And there's a number of things you need to do. First of all, you need to educate people to understand the intricacies of this. And that's really hard, either because people don't want to listen or it's too complex. And particularly in the air domain, we've been guilty of using language or concepts that no one can get their head around. You and I have spent 35 years trying to convince sailors and soldiers what it was all about. So let alone you know, Joe Public. Um, so you write a simple book. That's the first start. Put it in simple language. Explain the concepts simply. 10 essays of 600 words it takes about five minutes to read. You know, and if you can't read for five minutes, then we've got a problem. But, but it's beyond that. It's how do you then enrich that debate in forums like this, you know, on social media, um, you and I know on, on Twitter, you can only use so many characters and I try and get the maximum out of those characters to try and sell simple concepts that people then begin to understand. Um, so there's an education first and foremost, and that's not just to the average taxpayer. Obviously, they need to understand where their money's going to, but it's also to politicians. I saw a great photograph the other day of, of all the new politicians in parliament for this parliament. It's over a third. Over a third of them are brand new. Wow. And, and I don't know many of those. Actually, I think one of them's from the Air Force and at least one from, from the Royal Marines. So, and, and there's some soldiers in there too. So there's some ex-military people are now in entering parliament. But actually educating 200 new politicians, you've got a whole bunch of other stuff to learn too. Mm. You know, and, and let's be honest, defence will be up there on their, on their list, but it wasn't the high priority in the election. There's only five of them that actually matter. So, that, Well, that and, and that is key. And, and therefore helping them understand the arguments in a dispassionate way. We can't just sit there and say, it's air power, give us all your money, mm. you know, if only. Um, it's about building an argument, building an understanding, so that when mm. decisions are having to be made on what you do and what you can't do, mm. you do it from an informed position. Mm. Mm. And that is a challenge. Well, I mean, I, I so I've got two air guys here. Um, one might say you would, you know, stick out for air. Um, we'll maybe come back to that. I'm sure if Chris Parry was here, He'd be saying that you know projecting power across the world is a lot easier if you've got carriers, which has air power on, and yeah. they only travel at twenty five miles an hour. So you have to wait for a while before they arrive. <laughs> I knew it. Anyway, I knew it. Um, so why am I concerned? Because that how, how you balance that across the three forces, I, I'm, I'm forces. I don't I don't know, but clearly there's going to be some arguments. Okay, those things can can generally be overcome. The next reason I'm not confident is we know there are siren voices out there at the moment with whatever you know reasons are saying, it's okay, it's all going to be fixed by doing this. Everything's going to be drones in the future. It'd be fine. And, and some people, some politicians will like that story and they might buy it. The third reason I'm worried is that we've yet to see the Labour Party's true colours on defence. We know what they've said. The King's Speech said we are all... But if somebody starts asking them for not... 2.5% or 3% or 3.5% or 4%. Firstly, they haven't got the money. Yeah. Secondly, have they really got the political will to do something in the time frame that we need it? Yeah. You know, Keir Starmer uh, managed his entire party, the broad church, extremely well, I think, yeah. to get to an election and win it. Yeah. He's now got to confront the extreme left. There's, an, you know, there's a big rump of the party that won't be too happy if, this, if the outcome of this is we need something big. So that's a lot of questions to, to try and address. So let's try and work it backwards. So the, the, the book actually addresses that in chapter 10. It talks about, okay, so what do we do? Mm. Um, we don't prescribe a certain percentage of GDP because it'll be what it'll be. Mm. But if you've only got so much, 
these are the order with which you should address the problem set. And actually, our first step is not go buy more stuff. Mm. It would be tempting to do that. Mm. And, and a lot of people are arguing for more stuff um, or more people. Actually, the argument initially to solve the problem today is go and buy actually more stuff, as it turns out. But that stuff is weapons, it's spares, it's ancillaries, it's infrastructure. So it's it's actually the foundations that we need to fix first, mm. not not do the fancy stuff. Um, you need to fix the people problem first. All three services are exiting more than they're bringing in. So we need to fix mm. that first. So so there are some steps here that you need to take. As you take those steps, the budget will start to disappear. And eventually you'll probably find that just fixing those foundations, you've probably not got much left, actually. Mm. So if you want to buy more of something, which may well be an outcome, you're probably going to have to stop spending money on something you're already spending money on. So this is going to be... And I think this will be the test of Labour, coming back to your second question. You know, how, do, how does Labour pass this test? I think they're approaching it in the right way, personally. So that's a start. I think the previous reviews we've had have told some fibs. Mm. They've, they've written lovely language about what we're going to do and how we're going to meet the threat and then not put enough money in to do it, but actually said, and therefore this will fix it all. And it hasn't. Mm. It hasn't. It clearly has not fixed it. So, so I, what we do not need is another review that puts some flowery language pretends that the budget's enough to fix the problems and then say, job done, see you in five years. Um, but in order to square that circle, in order to meet their fiscal constraint, because Labour will want to spend money on the other things, whether it's health, social welfare, or whatever it might be, um, defence is therefore not going to get a buy here. Mm. So if defence is going to be true to itself, it's going to have to be honest about what it will no longer do. Mm. Um, I've got my own views on some of those things. And you could argue whether I would say that, wouldn't I? Actually, there are some air power things we could let go. Mm. If if you are now going to be a NATO-focused military, do we need to be dropping people by parachute? Do we need to be flying the army by air when actually you can go by road or rail? Mm. So there are some questions there. Are we going to buy exquisite I-Star platforms that won't survive in the type of scenario that we're talking about on an eastern front of NATO. So there are some things that air can let go. Are you going to be flying uh, uh, people around the battlefield in helicopters? Hmm. They don't seem to survive very long. So so there are some things that air would have to give up to, potentially, hmm. but so are the other two services too. And I'm not sure they're all mentally ready for that, but I think the only way you're going to afford a good enough military to slot into NATO, you're going to have to stop doing some stuff. So picking up on that point then, so one of the voices in the defence review will be national industry because they'll be saying this is jobs, it's prosperity. Mm -hmm. And the Global Combat Air Programme is one of those. Uh, Tempest, you know, looks like, looks a sexy aeroplane, next generation fighter jet. Um, but of course, the gestation of that idea was before Ukraine. It was before we saw everything yeah. going on at the moment. And, you know, there is a danger that that, that may well be the answer, but... It, it, we've got to be very careful that that's not an industry-sponsored answer yeah. and that it, it, it shouldn't be one of the defence priorities simply because it creates jobs for British industry. Yeah. And and therefore, what's your take on how that... Because it, it, it's almost back to the the answer is GCAP. Yeah. What's the question? Because we have it already in our... Um, and, and that yeah. slightly philosophically is, is, a, is, is not a very tight argument. Yeah, excellent question. So let me just s sort of separate that out. First of all, let me declare my conflict of interest. So I work for two UK defence companies, um, neither of which are on the GCAP programme. So let's just get that out of the way. So I, I also have an industrial viewpoint on this too. Um, on the second issue, is Tempest important to the Air Force? Um, yes, because it's the replacement for Typhoon. And at the moment, there is no other option unless you go and buy foreign, which you could do. Um, but that's a separate question about whether you then lose sovereign control, whether that's the right answer. So th th those are the basic questions. And at the moment, the Air Force is behind the Tempest because if you want to have a Tempest-like capability or better in 10 years' time, the answer is you've got to buy something else. Um, you could maybe stretch Typhoon out 15, 20 years. So there's a question there. And obviously, you've got F-35 in the mix as well. But if you're going to go down the Tempest route, how much money do you spend on Typhoon and F-35 on that journey? 
But I think there's a broader issue here. I absolutely get the industrial argument. You know, F-35 today, Typhoon today and Tempest tomorrow brings a high level of investment into the country. It brings in skilled jobs. It brings in investment. It brings in research and development, industrial capacity and all of those things. My concern is, can that just be borne by the Ministry of Defence? Now, if you're going to make a national argument that says we need Tempest for defence, but we need the industry for growth and prosperity, then that's fine. But maybe the answer isn't that MOD picks up the entire tab. And I would rather see that argument being made by business and trade or the cabinet office. And maybe the Treasury has to stump up the money that pays for that element, whilst the MOD pays for their element on R&D and stuff. And effectively, what you're then not doing is giving the MOD the whole R&D bill for Tempest. Um, and I think that's that's never been done before. We've never really approached it like no, that. No, we had. I remember in my time in MOD, just to flush this one out, because I think sometimes people don't understand the discussion here. I remember an example being used that we had a requirement for a military capability that you could buy in this country for 140 million, or you could buy from France for 100 million. Yeah. And so the MOD went, well, we've got to go with the cheapest. We've got to save 40 million. Yeah. If you looked at it from a UK perspective, if you bought the UK 140 million more expensive, 42% of that investment yep. recycled back into jobs, into taxes, into local shops, into whatever. So actually, the program from a UK perspective was cheaper yep. than buying from France. Yep. But because MOD had to pick up the full bill, it had no choice. Yep. And creating a different dialogue with the treasury yes. that recognize the value of national programs yep. that is where that's a really interesting discussion point because yep. for some reason the treasury was never prepared to have it, that conversation it's a, it, it's a fundamental business decision that needs to be had um, so it makes me much broader argument it's the same thing with shipbuilding too so so when beer systems rightly will say um gcap will bring in let's say 30 billion pounds worth of investment how much of that goes to the mod well none of it well, surely the MOD should get some credit for that because it's their money that's paid for the program. So, yeah, it's it's squaring off that equation and how the, the numbers flow through the broader business case is is critical to this because then then it's not the MOD picking up the whole tab um, and then you can make the case. So I, I think and that's the answer to your question. There is a way to square this off, but it has to be done in a much broader economic sense than just looking at the MOD budget. Hmm. I know when we've talked about drones in the past, because, I mean, unmanned has been around for longer than manned has, let's be, be clear. Yeah. Um, whilst drone warfare is clearly the cutting edge of what's happening in Ukraine, they're talking about about half the military effectiveness now, a terror weapon, because the people on the battlefield are running yeah. away all the time. But I also take your point, you've used the, the throwaway line, that it's just a glamorous way of delivering a hand grenade. But given that, that actually the advent of technology, the, the way that the front line can rapidly iterate yep. this on an overnight basis, which is diametrically opposed to what you and I know the MOD can do, is there something about the defence review that isn't just about drones? It's about how you rapidly adopt emerging technology in a really dynamic way which isn't just about technology. It's also about safety cases. It's about your appetite for risk, etc. Surely that should be part of this defence review as well. Uh, it absolutely should be. And I, I think um, we can absolutely expect um, <coughs> Richard Barons to do that. He, 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 he was the commander of strategic command. They were focused on the sort of bits in the seams, if you like, that make defense work as opposed to the sort of sexy lumps of iron that, that do, the, do the fighting. So whether it be cyber, whether it be space, whether it be AI or autonomous systems, they absolutely have to be in the mix because where they make sense and where they are a cheaper way of delivering the same effect, it absolutely makes sense. Chapter six <laughs> talks about drones, but actually what it says is, although it's always historically been a, a, an Air Force issue, it's all been about pilots. It's about being, get rid of you and me. Um, and actually, if you remove a pilot from Tempest, I'm not sure you save that much money. 
I don't think you can do it yet either, my personal view. So we're still some way off technically being able to replace a human in that loop. And morally and ethically, we may not want to remove the human from that loop. But actually, just removing a, a seat and some oxygen doesn't actually save you an awful lot of money. So let's not kid ourselves that removing pilots suddenly saves you a shed load of money. But if you can bring drones into the mix, and if you can use drones to decoy, uh, to increase mass, that whether that be on land, sea, or in the air, uh, and and therefore you get more mass for less cost, that's absolutely going to be part of the equation. It'd be crazy not to do that. And I think what we're seeing in Ukraine is is how drones have filled a void where a lack of mortars or artillery hasn't been able to do the job. And and I think. So it's not just a question for air forces. It's absolutely a question for navies and a question for armies about, you know, do you need a, do you need attack helicopters? Do you need mortars and artillery in the same numbers, shape and size that you've got when actually you can do the job as efficiently or more so using drone technology? Yeah, I guess part of the question, I think, was about the um, the relationship with British industry. And because and, and, for my sins, for a couple of years, I was executive chairman of an SME that yeah. was doing uh, mixed reality training. Yeah. The Defence Accelerator Program, they, they won a, yeah. a, a competition, developed a capability, went back into the MOD to, to showcase what they had paid for. None of yeah. the service wanted to listen to it. And you went, hang on a minute, you've just invested this money. Each of the services still does their own thing in technology. Yeah. The Rapid Capability Office is thriving. Yeah, And you sort of go, how on earth do you create an ecosystem here? You and I have long argued about um, the role of synth- synthetic training. Yeah, you know, if the future is alliances, we've got to be able to train together. Yeah, difficult to do that in the real world. Yeah, ships, yeah. tanks, and aircraft, not just yeah. nationally but internationally, create an ecosystem. We we've been talking about it as long as you and I've been in service, yeah, yeah. and we're still not there. How do you create a conversation that breaks apart some of these stovepipes? So again, in the book, we list these foundational capabilities. Two of them are: you have an industrial defense strategy that works that isn't favoring the primes. That's the first thing you've got to do. And you need a procurement system that is able to adapt into exactly what you describe. Um, And we know how it works in reality. The prime wins the contract, brings in the SMEs, or buys them up, or or just kills them off. Uh, And then it it ends up in this bureaucratic, long-winded procurement process that no SME can survive because you know in an SME organization if you're not seeing money in investment and and seeing a product coming out the door within six months to 12 months your your business model doesn't work Um, so to be told that you'll have a meeting in six months there'll be a competition and in two years time there'll be a decision forget it you're going to walk away um, and you'll end up talking to the gaming industry so how do these ideas though so the government's asked for a um, essays. Yeah, Richard Barons will have a lot of essays. Yeah, you know, he's a smart guy, but yeah. I wonder how much he'll actually read them. This yeah. and things like this yeah, yeah. will will a good. Yeah, but how how are these arguments going to genuinely resonate with all these new politicians? Uh, yeah. That actually create a different conversation around defence, rather than it being. Oh, you would say that, wouldn't you? Oh, you would say that, wouldn't you? Yeah. So it's it's as simple as, except it's not simple. It, it, so if the debate is all about two and a half or two percent or three percent, that that's my concern. Is that that's the wrong debate? Okay. Whether it's two and a half, three or two, you've got to spend it better. Yeah. That that's a given. If we just put two and a half percent or three percent into the current system, it'll it'll continue to spend it badly. So that's not going to help anybody. So you need to fundamentally reform your procurement model. And, and that is really difficult because everyone's tried, tried numerous times and failed. Um, and, and it needs to be a completely fresh start. And, and that's going to be hard to swallow and it's going to be really hard to deliver. So I think it's telling that this review is being done independently. Um, now, you could argue all three of them are insiders. So they're independent now, but they weren't independent previously. So will they have enough nows to think differently? I think the trick actually is bringing in the people that work in those types of businesses you've just described to explain the challenge of what it means to be an SME working with industry, uh, working with the MOD. Now, the MOD track their SME stats, and they're very proud of it, saying we've now got this many SMEs, but they're all working within a prime construct, mostly, not all, but mostly. So the rapid capability office type approaches are, are science projects that have little wins. They don't have the big wins. You know, how many SMEs are truly in the GCAP program? You know, we're talking about a 10-year gestation period. You know, that's not an SME business model. So um, I think the fundamental change has got to occur in procurement. 
And and I don't know if they're mentally prepped for that. That saddens me, though, because if the answer is a fundamental review of procurement, I, in my lifetime and yours, we've seen that done several times, and it's never worked. Byrne has been yeah. a supplier into the MOD, yeah. and we probably uh, haven't got time to listen to his tirade about how poor it is. So these reviews and reorganisations haven't actually delivered no, they haven't. the answer. No, they haven't. And, and that's why that's the most difficult aspect. Not not winning 2.5% out of Rachel Reeves, that, that may or may not come to fruition. The, the, hard, the hard yards is going to be done in the new strategic headquarters with the new armaments director, I think, the name they're coming up with. So that armaments director has got to have teeth. Proper teeth. But that feels more about getting the stockpiles up again rather well, than actually, you know, a fundamental look at... I mean, what's, what's your take on this? Because you, you're you normally quite vocal about... Well, from an SME point of view. Yeah. Well, industry, engagement with industry, the role of technology. Well, I think... What do I think? I think, firstly, the uh, military system in the UK needs to be a lot faster, uh, especially at turning around the adoption of new technology. I mean, I... Th- We've said it so many times, but it's just got to be. Um, you know, we saw the effect in on the ground in Ukraine, the ability to basically turn something around overnight. Uh, I'm damn sure. I mean, even with the URR programs, um, it would take longer. So I think those are the first two comments to make. The second one is, if you really want uh, innovation from the ground, you've got to find a way of working with smaller companies. Yeah. You know? um, Huge chunk of real good innovation comes from small companies. You know, you made the point they get, you know, bought up. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's not such a good thing, particularly in the early days. Um, but, you know, to encourage SMEs to do that, you've got to cope with the fact that you can sync them with meetings. The problem is, as you know, Bern, you've got to, you've got to scale up you know, those bright ideas. And, and that's the tough bit for an SME. How, how do you bring something? You can't build a tempest by bringing together 300 SMEs and somehow creating a, an airplane that flies. So there is a need for primes and bigger companies to scale up. The trick is how, and, and and maybe they're the ones that have got to shake up too. So industry does have a responsibility here and they can't hide behind the stats of saying, I mean, I think I read just the other day that um, BS Systems are now looking at a number of drone companies to purchase. Mm. Well, the drone companies will be licking their lips because yeah. they'll make their money and walk away. Do we think those will come out the production line any faster? Um, possibly not. And I think getting to this, challenge, might be a lot more expensive as well. well <coughs> but I don't challenge the model because you, you. So if BSC, I'm being gloriously flippant now. Yeah. But things like the B52 yeah. will be around that platform. Will mm. be around for 100 years. Yeah. The platform itself. Yeah. It's largely just got to be strong, yeah, yeah. resilient, carry yeah. fuel, that sort of stuff. The yeah. um, tempest. The, yeah. The regardless how sexy it looks and a yeah. little bit of stealthy, yeah. inside it is where the real capability lies. Yeah. Inside it is the little boxes of tricks that are yeah, constantly yeah. overnight. It's the drone, but yeah. on speed, yeah. that people need to innovate. That that bit doesn't have to be a prime. That It has to be a prime to do the big platform, and the big platform, uh, the big uh, prime will argue why it has to be them to run the whole program. Yeah. But most of the primes that you and I both know, it's a one year and a few million to even get out of bed. The problem is, is that you, you can you can describe you know open system architectures and a plug and play approach, but unless you're going to write the Tempest software in iOS, um, you're not going to have some SME coming in and saying, "I've got a great app for your software um, that suddenly does this or that." So you, to, just to insert yourself into that problem is going to be difficult. Coming back to Burns' point, I mean, there there are ways forward in this. So if you're going to have a system that that let's say is a one way drone. It's an attack drone that is only ever going to fly in a war, war scenario. You're not going to train with it. Then you could maybe temper down the safety rules that would allow you to introduce it far quicker with less restrictions. So there might be ways to, to attack that. But even that, I think, is going to be a challenge. And, and others have written on this subject. The level of risk that we currently impose on our programs is too high. It's too high a bar. Mm, mm. And, and, and how are you going to be able to drop that bar that you can do it faster and cheaper? Tempest says it will do that. It's going to take a whole new approach. But we're still talking 10 years away. We're still talking mm, mm, 10 years mm. away with a prototype not mm. currently in construction. There was a marketing tweet yesterday mm. from BA Systems on GCAP that said it was, it was existing technology. Well, okay. Well, if it's existing technology, then why can't you do it now? Mm-hmm. I mean, the last the last project I did before I moved on from being a supplier in defence was the Pan Navy support system. Yeah. So across the entire yeah. Navy, dockyards, the whole yeah, lot, yeah. Um, above and below. Um, now we started small. We got 
Very good sponsorship. We we chose not to work through a prime. Yeah. Because that would have sunk us. Yeah. And the price would have gone up like 10 Excuse times. The yeah. The second thing the Navy did, they assigned a very, very small team yeah. with decision-making power, like yeah, yeah. three people. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to what normally happens is you get 50 people involved. Yeah. And in a year's time, you've sort of worked through your first stage of meetings. Yeah. We got the first implementation of the system up um, in three or four months. Yeah. At an incredibly low price. But all those other bits had to, you know, somebody, I mean, Radikin was the first sea lord. So he sort of took control of it. Yeah. And he sort of made the system fit. Yeah, you know, a nimble approach to it. Without that, the thing just wouldn't have worked. And, and you can do that. There are examples where that happens, but it's it's not in a it's not in a true warfighting equipment sense, which is where things sort of really start to slow up. But you're right. There are things we can do now with AI and technology and 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 software where we can actually use what we've currently got better. And and I know the Air Force has said this, and I'm sure the Navy feel it too. That productivity is half the problem. That even when you've bought these bits of kit, we're only getting fifty percent usage out. I think today all six astute submarines are in dock yeah i mean by 12 by all means but yeah are they all going to be in dock can i just challenge things like you talked about an ios software in a way i think surely that is the answer because actually what you incentivize today yeah is every uh, sme comes up with their own architecture their own software because yeah. their own database because actually you have to go back to them to get it updated yeah and one of the frustrations you know i you know we salisbury plain was a range we used to train regularly in mm -hmm. i remember doing a study with 42 different databases of salisbury plain that the mod owned we had to go to different suppliers to get them up to date yeah, yeah if we had agreed in ios software yeah and then said that is the datum that you've all got to operate now you can do a plug and play not only just in an aircraft but in international training yeah networking your simulators all that sort you of absolutely stuff. could do that and 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 if it's in a non uh risky end of defense whatever that whatever that definition might be nuclear would be one obvious example um you might be able to accept the level of risk but if you end up relying on big tech as now the fundamental thing that underpins your capability we're probably already there with spacex as an example um and we're probably not far away from amazon google and and apple in terms of some of our reliance on some of our systems and, and then you have a situation like we had just a few weeks ago where a software designed to protect all those systems suddenly crashes because one line of code is wrong or china infiltrates it and causes mayhem so Yes, all of those things could be done, but they all come with an element of risk that we just need to think through. One of the great things about aircraft today is their software is so bespoke; it'd be quite difficult to penetrate inside it to be able to, ja uh, to be but able that, to. But that creates this virus. legacy old environment where yeah. I know when the Typhoon it's came in, it was, software. most of the software was ten years old. Yeah. And you went, imagine having a mobile phone that was ten years yeah. old. You know, that's the, how old it is. The final bit I have for you here is it, it, it is air and space that you look after mm. in terms of the association. Um, how well understood do you think are the capabilities of space, our yeah. vulnerability, and therefore what should we as a nation be doing differently? Quite poorly understood. I mean, if you were to ask people about, you know, what do they think space is for, they, they, they'd probably have a few memories. If they're old enough, they'll remember somebody walking on the moon um, and, and lunar landings. People will know that there are some satellites out there that maybe allow them to get to grandma's house on time or or, or they may have read of a Chinese anti-satellite test. So their, their level of knowledge will be quite thin. When you begin to unpick how our world runs on space technologies, whether that's timing whether it's precision navigation um we're highly reliant if you, if you turned off the gps global system today all our atm machines shut down banking would stop um, it is so reliant because because transactions are now electronic they rely on exact timing that exact timing comes from space so if you kill space you kill that timing um and so yes our world has got more efficient and more effective because our global reach and global understanding but our reliance now on those systems to be maintained is absolute um and uh, there have been a number of studies uh, um we even quote them actually um in one of the chapters in here that uh, i think it was the blackett review that looked i think just global positioning system brings something like 15 billion pounds of revenue into the uk and since then, it's now trebled. And if we lost it for one day, it would cost the country seven billion quid. Ouch. 
So when you start to look at the, the economics of space, they become quite real. Now, you can't just shut space down. Actually, Elon Musk might, might be able to actually. I know he's got a button under his desk. But when China starts sending up anti-satellite tests or Russia uh, blows up a satellite in space and creates 30,000 lumps of metal flying around the, the low Earth orbit, they are basically demonstrating that they are prepared and able to create problems in space. So a lot of what we do in space now is actually just keeping an eye on all those flying objects to make sure they don't bump into each other. But if you start flying satellite, anti-satellite missiles or using other satellites that can fly alongside your satellite and maybe cause it some mischief, um, we have got a problem. And I don't think we in the UK or in the world genuinely understand our reliance on space systems. But do you think, we, we've already just said that, that, that 2.5%, 3% won't be enough to buy the right number of ships, tanks and aeroplanes. Once you go into the space domain, it feels like you're talking about a couple of orders of magnitude, more money and scale. Yes, although I think if you look at the amount of money that the US military spend on their space, it's way above what we spend in percentage terms. Percentage terms, yeah. In percentage terms, we are, you know, minute actually. So we, we need to think long and hard about whether we're spending enough on space even now, let alone in the future. Um, the good news is in space is you can get quite a lot for the return on your investment. So, you know, whether it's a couple of Skynet satellites giving you satellite, you know, we, we just assume now that we can talk to our, our assets around the world. We just assume that. Well, that wasn't the case 30, 40 years ago. So we've already got to a position now where we're wholly reliant. You, you and I know that the weapons we carry today are wholly reliant on space, um, as are the aircraft that launch them. So um, we do need to make sure it's robust enough. The danger now is we're really quite highly reliant on civilian companies providing those systems. Um, and I think that's the other problem in space is that military and commercial are now almost inseparable. But in a way, that's why I play back to you, because I, I, I agree with you about the, our uh, reliance on space. But take the GPS satellite system. There, there is one software system talking to each other and back to the UK. Yeah. So as soon as we start going, oh, we're a bit worried about doing networking our military capability on the ground. We do that in space and we do it in one software. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've managed to crack it. Um, in space so why can't we do that on the ground and I think the answer is we haven't actually cracked it in space we've just gone we think we have we've got a way of coordinating all this stuff and it's not vulnerable to Chinese or Russian attack yeah well we, we haven't cracked it in space because it is vulnerable yeah. to attack either physically or electronically so if you read in the newspapers only over the last few weeks you know the number of times that GPS systems or ADS systems have been attacked either over the Atlantic or around the Baltic area. You know, I think the Secretary of State at the time was allegedly jammed in his aircraft. It wasn't personal. I think it was a bit more of a general uh, jamming than that. But the, these, so those that don't understand the GPS system, it's, it's a relatively weak signal by the time it comes from space. It's quite easy to jam localized isn't yeah, it? yeah yeah within a certain area but you, yeah. so if a if a weapon for example is relying on gps signal if you put a jammer around your sensitive target you can effectively deny that weapon the gps signal so right. it, it's not difficult to do which is why the next thing you then do is target the gps jammer so it becomes again it, it's like an, a, a, was it the old lady who swallowed a fly i mean that's exactly what this has now become it's become a complete but game. But it's also that because they're, 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 after the Secretary of State got caught out, there was an interesting story that said, actually, I got asked to do an interview about it. And I said, you do realise that most of the airlines, they know routinely that they get jammed. And there yeah, was suddenly yeah. a furore that our yeah, yeah. public. And you went, now, hang on a minute. The, you know, these airlines have got lots of other ways of navigating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they, they, it, 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 one of the ways is via G, you know, GPS. Yeah, uh, well, the good news is we haven't become wholly reliant on GPS. But there is a time in the in, in the future where, whether it's driverless cars or automatic landing pilotless airplanes, where if you lose that GPS signal or lose that satellite comm signal, it doesn't work. I guess my, my final question on this is um, we're both of a similar vintage, aren't we? It's now a much more dangerous world. Technology has been our asymmetric advantage, but other nations are catching up. And we haven't got any money. Does that worry you? Because are we actually entering a period where the stability we took for granted for 30 years, mm. Russia has shown that there are countries out there that have different priorities. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and, let, and we don't have a credible deterrence with a small d. I'm not yeah. talking about nuclear. I'm talking about... Yeah, yeah. And, and we're not going to suddenly tomorrow flick a switch and it's going to come round. Do you think that leaves us vulnerable? So you just described the reason why we wrote the book. Um, so the book takes you through that journey. In fact, chapter one is called Precipice. 
it, it means we, we are at a point now where we've underinvested for a long period of time. We may be spent quite a lot of that money on 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 the wars that we're no longer facing and therefore forgot to prioritize the ones that now are literally smacking us in the face um and at a time when there's not a lot of money to throw at the problem and fix it because you can't just fix it overnight um and so it takes you through a series of steps of how you then recover that position so does it worry me yes um i've been saying it for decades so um and you can google that it says I, I absolutely had got in trouble in the past even when i was serving got in trouble for doing it so it, it's not new to me it, it's just that you've been boiling that frog for so long it, you know the, the skin's gone the, the flesh has gone and now there's just a skeleton in there so that's not a frog anymore um and you do need to recover because the threat is real it's not like i'm i'm making up this threat that that, that is now facing us and it, and in the book says in a more dangerous world so it, it, it quotes it but you can recover it just that, that you have to decide how fast you need to recover my view is we need to recover some things quite quickly because we we've definitely made some mistakes that need fixing now um particularly weapon stockpiles and 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 the depth of the resilience within the military Th those things need to be fixed first and foremost and then over time you can start to recover some of those other things the good news is is we are in a, a strong alliance we are within nato and therefore we we're not on our own here so these newspaper articles that compare us to russia you know one on one that, that's not the that's not the problem set um, in fact it, because we keep thinking that's the problem set we keep buying things that we don't need on our own um but we shouldn't be blind to the fact that america might walk a bit further away from us than perhaps we've been used to um and therefore the european end of nato needs to think long and hard about what it needs to do to look after itself you use a lovely quote in here about churchill um just before the start of the second world war that effectively yeah. says we're just not ready yeah feels like a bit of deja vu yeah, I think that quote was in 1936. I, I, I'll have to go back and look at it afterwards. But uh, and he and he called it the locust years, where when we saw the problem, we didn't react to it early enough, and instead of actually fixing the problem, we made it worse. You know, we allowed literally the locusts to come and pick off the pieces, uh, and 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 then when you need to harvest it, it's gone. Um, a lot of other people say, oh, this, this is 1938, this is 1938. I, I could care less about what year people think it is in comparison to the Second World War. In the Second World War, we converted piano factories to make mosquitoes. We are not going to do that to make tempests. So we're going to end up fighting with what we've got. But also, we had two years. We had an embarrassing retreat from the European continent. Yeah, we did. And we licked our wounds for a couple of years yeah. whilst we worked out what we're going to do next. And I'm not GD sure we're going to have two years... And I think our GD spend eventually during that war went up to 40% on defence. Uh, and we brought in rationing. Now, I'm not sure the UK population is ready for any of those conversations. So comparisons to the Second World War are bogus. But they're bogus because it's actually worse now. We, if we're talking about replacing aeroplanes in 10 years' time, we haven't got 10 years. Um, so yeah, it, the problem is more stark.